Good afternoon, everyone. How are you all doing? Good. Can you hear me in the back? We're good with it? Okay, great. So thank you. Happy New Year to everyone. Thank you all for attending our first What Matters to Me and Why this semester. Really appreciate your presence here. How many uh, people here have never been to one of these before? First timers? Great. Great. Well, welcome. We hope to see you uh, throughout the semester. We do this uh, basically once a month. Um, we have a great lineup for the rest of the semester. Of course, David Albertson today. Then we have Oliver Mayer from the School of Dramatic Arts, uh, Ginger Clark from the Rossier School of Education, and Laura Baker from the Dornsife College. So we hope you join us for all of them and their flyers in the back, so please let others know as well. If you haven't grabbed any food, please grab some food. If you would like somewhere to sit, there's some spots up here. Um, and um, and um, I'm just gonna shamelessly promote a few upcoming things before we get into our speaker today. Um, tonight, we're hosting a town forum on campus climate with Provost Michael Quick. Uh, we're in the middle of a large task force initiative looking at diversity, uh, inclusion, equity, and opportunity uh, on our campus. We're going to host five town hall meetings over the course of the semester. Tonight's the first one. It's at 7.30 p.m. at DML 240. So please join us at the Doheny Memorial Library at 240. It's open to everyone. And uh, this is really a campus conversation. We need it's a shared responsibility for all of us to, I think, create a campus climate we can all be proud of. So I'd love to see you there uh, participating in the conversation. Later on this afternoon, you're going to get a memo from the provost's office announcing new mindful USC classes. So I wanted to give you a, a heads up before that went out. We have uh, 10 new classes for this semester. They're free and open to uh, faculty, students, and staff. They're five to eight weeks each. Mindful self-compassion, mindful writing, introduction to mindfulness, a whole host of classes. Um, if you go to mindful.usc.edu, you can sign up. I, I know they're going to fill up quickly. So if you're interested, I would suggest that you, uh, you sign up as soon as possible for the courses. This weekend, we're co-sponsoring a really incredible conference with the law school, both the UCI uh, Law School and the USC Law School, called What Cannot Be Said. It's a conversation about uh, offensive speech and the limits of free speech. Um, on Saturday at 10.30 a.m., we'll be live streaming uh, a Skype conversation with Edward Snowden at the law school. He's the keynote. Uh, and on Sunday, we'll actually be on this campus. 10 a.m., we're going to be at the Ronald Tudor Campus Center Ballroom. Uh, there'll be a conversation with Krista Tippett, who's an amazing um, uh, uh, radio personality. She has a NPR show called On Being. She's a recent recipient of the Kennedy Awards um, honors by President Obama. And we just found out this morning we'll also be joined by Chuck D of Public Enemy. He'll be talking about rap lyrics and um, the limits of free speech versus offensive speech within um, within uh, the artistic and musical world. Um, so that's at 10 a.m. Sunday at the Ronald Tudor Campus Center Ballroom. It's free and open to the public. It's first come, first serve. I think we're going to have a lot of people there, so please show up a little early if you want to attend. And on February 2nd at 7 p.m. at the Crusoe Catholic Center, we're hosting Sherman Jackson, who's a professor of Islamic studies here at USC, one of the great scholars of Islam in the world. Uh, he's going to give a talk called The Islamist Response to ISIS. Um, that's at the Crusoe Catholic Center at 7 p.m. on February 2nd. It's also free and open the public. So hope to see you at those events. For more information, check out orl.usc.edu. As many of you know, this is a national series now. Even though it's our 15th year here, every year new colleges and un or more colleges and universities add what matters to me, why, in their programming, and um, many of them model it after what we're doing here. And one of the reasons we've been so successful over the last 15 years is the student participation and leadership of the series. Uh, students nominate speakers and they introduce them. So I'm really grateful for the opportunity to introduce you to the speaker who will introduce uh, Professor Albertson today. Um, our student um, uh, speaker is Abram uh, Estafanos. He's a senior. He's only got one more semester here. He's a religion major in the Dornsife College. He's been a student of David's for two classes. Um, please join me in welcoming Abram uh, to the What Matters to Me and Wide stage. Uh, thank you, Dean Sony. <clears throat> I would also like to thank the uh, what Matters to Me and Why program for having me here today to introduce uh, Professor Albertson. So in this like very brief introduction, I just wanted to focus on two points I thought were really great about Dr. Albertson and then kind of mention like three uh, very small examples of how he kind of like helped me out during my college career uh, through two classes, uh, a letter of rec, and then kind of helping us uh, to like start a club on campus 
um, you know, functioning as faculty advisor. So the two like points I thought were really helpful or were, that were really great about Dr. Robertson that really helped me were uh, a genuine willingness to always help students, even you know, giving his own time, um, and then an approachability outside of the classroom that was ultimately really great to student learning. And then I just listed you know, three really small examples, but they're ones that I really appreciate and they really helped me out. Um, so the first one in the, the second class I took with <clears throat> Dr. Albertson was religion and ethics. Um, it was a really small class, really discussion based, um, eight people in the class. And it was really, you know, I thought important to always kind of attend every class to kind of keep the, the flow of the discussion going, to share ideas with other students and to, you know, learn from them, learn from the professor and also contribute my own ideas. Um, but there was one class I remember I couldn't make. I had, uh, you know, a conflict. But I remember Dr. Albertson, you know, he offered to, uh, you know, we, we to like kind of schedule a makeup class with me. Um, and we did it right here at Little, uh, Literati at, uh, outside the Weenie Library. Um, and it was great, you know, I, I've never heard of like a professor going out of his way to, you know, be, you know, meet with a student outside of class, make sure no material was missed, keep the discussion going. Um, so that was great. And it was something really small, but I really appreciated it. And it, you know, it really helped me out. Um, and then like the second example uh, I have is um, a letter of rec from Professor Albertson. Um, I applied to med school this past uh, cycle and I received a letter of rec from him. Again, he, he kindly accepted to write it for me um, in the midst of his research and his personal work. Um, and it really helped me and I know in the event of an acceptance to med school, uh, that letter will have played like a really large part. And then lastly, um, a third example was a new club some people and I were trying to start on campus was a USC Coptic club. It's kind of like an Egyptian cultural religious Christian club. Um, and then Dr. Albertson, we asked him if he could be the faculty advisor for this club and he kindly agreed. Um, and you know, it'll be great to receive his advice and his input regarding the more practical affairs of the club, you know, how to run it, meet with uh, USC representatives and stuff like that. So, I mean, the, these, you know, three examples may seem really small, but they were really, um, you know, I really appreciated them. He was really kind to do that, you know, giving us time and his energy to, um, to write the letter, to help us start the club. Um, and I know definitely if, you know, if I end up, you know, graduating from med school, becoming a doctor, and I, I'm teaching like med students or residents, I'd be more than happy to, um, you know, take them under my wing, kind of uh, mentor them as he did for me. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Albertson. Thank you, Avram, for that very kind introduction and for the invitation to speak here from, uh, from Jim and Varun. I actually came to What Matters to Me and Why Talks as an undergraduate, um, and Jim was there at them. So that either speaks to my youth, or I'd like to share with you today why I do what I do at USC and how I think about it personally. I'm a professor of religious studies, and as you might guess, this is a very peculiar line of work. You can only imagine the conversations this invites when I'm trapped in an airplane seat for a long flight. I teach in a department called the School of Religion in Dornsife College. Like English or history, we're a humanities department, but for the academic study of religion. We study religion as a human phenomenon, rituals, texts, artifacts, institutions. I have colleagues who study all the oldest religions from Buddhism and Judaism, Hinduism, Christianity, and Islam. As you probably already know, our academic department, the School of Religion, is entirely separate from the Office of Religious Life who hosts this venerable series. The Office of Religious Life supports all the different religious communities of USC students. Our two departments are often confused, and perhaps for good reason. In the first place, you might think, why would someone need to study religion like biology or economics? Why not just practice a religion or don't practice it? How would you even go about studying religion as an academic field? And second, if for some reason you really felt the need to study religions, wouldn't you begin with the religious communities themselves back at the Office of Religious Life? These are good questions. Why study religion in the university? Why this peculiar vocation? As a way to sneak up on this question about religion on the one hand and the university on the other, I want to take a slight detour and tell you a story. 
I arrived at USC in 2007. My wife Annie and I were living in Chicago, but in 2006, the year before we came to USC, we moved to Germany and lived there for a year. We were going to be in different cities, so we decided to spend the summer together in Berlin, immersed in studying, in the words of Mark Twain, the awful German language. Annie had no German at all, but I was taking language courses during my PhD work at the University of Chicago. I was quite proud of my basic German grammar. We arrived in June at our shabby neighborhood in East Berlin, shabby chic. Our first task was to furnish our tiny apartment with all the basic supplies you need in the bathroom and the kitchen. So we were amused to find that the East Berlin Walmart Superstore was located on Karl Marxstrasse, and we rode our teetering secondhand bikes all the way there. Now this was our first major outing in Germany. I was awaiting the moment, of course, when I would be called upon to lead the way with my doctoral level German. Upon entering Walmart, I strode up to the first employee I could find. I had already carefully formulated my question the night before in German, using all the most polite articles and pronouns at my disposal, balancing verbs atop each other as the awful German language demands. Entschuldigung bitte. Könnten Sie mich mal einführen in den Bereich der Reinigung? Pardon me, could you please direct me toward the cleaning supply area? It went off just as elegantly as I had rehearsed. The woman stared back at me for a moment, staying uh, perfectly still, slowly replied with something in German that I did not understand. So of course I said, Annie, she said that way. I could not understand the words. Uh, the next day, I told the story to my German tutor. He could hardly conceal his polite German horror. For apparently what I had said was not, pardon me, could you please direct me to the cleaning supply area? What I had fact, in fact announced without any warning was, pardon me, could you please initiate me into the region of cleansing? <laughs> now let's take a moment to analyze just what went wrong there. My German sentence was impeccable. Every article declined, every verb conjugated. Einführen can mean guide or introduce, maybe more in the sense of religious rites of initiation that I have been studying in graduate school. Bereich means area, but in a bureaucratic sense, not store aisle. Reinigung, I probably should have looked up in my dictionary. I was thinking toilet bowl cleaners, but I guess it meant ancient purification rituals. <laughs> so my sentence was correct in terms of grammar, but disastrous in terms of communication. I was speaking German, but really only to myself. Now, I thought I was doing the right thing. I was being the good tourist. I worked hard on my sentence. I was trying to be self-reliant, to teach myself how to speak. What had I done wrong? I should have been aware that there were centuries of dialogue, millions of lives lived in German well before my attempt to join that conversation. I was not the first to step into that stream. What I should have done was join the conversation, join a community first. So that perhaps a few months later, after sharing the language with others under their guidance, dependent upon them, then I might have had the chance to craft my own words authentically. Not as a Frankenstein sentence from the dictionary, but maybe a casual remark to a friend. Then I could make a living contribution to a cultural reality larger than myself, a tradition larger than me, a tradition so large it would give me a platform to find my own footing. To find my independence, I needed to join the tradition. What matters to me and why? One thing that matters to me is tradition or traditions. Why? Because ever since college, but today more than ever, I find it indispensable to think and live in terms of traditions in a particular sense of that word that I want to explore with you. I think this is an important part of gaining wisdom, and I worry we do not share this wisdom enough with USC undergraduates. All of us belong to traditions. In fact, all of us belong unwittingly to far more traditions than we consciously know. And let that sink in for a moment. Your one life is being governed by traditions of thought and belief that you may not even know exist or what they contain. Traditions that have guided our basic sense of what life is for. What counts as something honorable or desirable? What duties we owe to others and which others? Whom to trust and whom to suspect 
at an instinctive level, what limits there are on who I might become. In all of these domains, I would submit, traditions precede individuals, even create individuals. Most Americans are Jeffersonian in their politics without having read a word of Jefferson. Most are Shakespearean in their sense of story and character without having studied Shakespeare. Most Americans echo the Abrahamic faiths in their basic moral assumptions, whether religious or not, about justice and providence and the disenfranchised without having read the Bible or the New Testament or the Quran. Perhaps like me, you like to imagine yourself as a rugged individual who stands alone before the mysteries of life and decides independently what to make of it all. But this is simply not how language and time work. Traditions provide a much better account of how we really think and believe as human beings. We are mortal animals with short lifespans. We are social animals that band together. We human animals think in communities. We think within a finite repertoire of cultural options. I like to think of traditions as long-term conversations that outlast the lives of their human participants, that precede our individual births and will outlive our individual deaths. They too are born and die, but their lifespan is on the scale of centuries or millennia. They're like the landscape of streets or basins that create the geography in which our everyday lives take place. We take for granted the cut of Truesdale across campus, the slow bend of Jefferson, the shade of Bovard that deliver us through our daily routines. Just like we take for granted the grammar and syntax that allow us to tell stories to each other. These are all systems of order in which we live and move and have our being. They give us the words to think, thoughts, it seems, we are the first to think. Let me make three controversial statements about traditions and then I promise we'll move on. First, I think everyone operates within one tradition or another, even if they claim otherwise. Traditions are like ecosystems. We all live inside them. They sustain us biologically. You're free to leave one, but only if you join another for air and water and food. If you are alive, you're living within one, whether you know it or not. Second, older traditions in many ways are better because they are more democratic. They grant voting rights to the dead, the past of their tradition, alongside those of us temporarily living. They listen to the voices of the dead in whose buildings we live, the dead whose languages we speak, whose institutions are right now shaping our identities. The Oxford medievalist C.S. Lewis liked to say, that for every book he read from the 20th century, he thought he should read two from the previous 19. Third point, when we forget our traditions, there's a danger that we could slip into amnesia or skepticism. We slip into amnesia when we forget there is little new under the sun, and we spend our lives passionately reinventing the wheel instead of gaining wisdom for the future. And we can slip into skepticism when we think we have to confront the vast wilderness of existence, unsheltered, unharbored by a tradition. If one has to solve the riddles of life all alone, agnosticism can begin to seem sensible. Traditions, on the other hand, I find, provide a sustainable shelter in which intellectual life can truly flourish in the wild. So these are my three controversial points you can take or leave. Traditions are unavoidable. The older ones are better. Without them, we often make big mistakes. Now, as promised, let's go back to the beginning. Why should I spend my time studying religions in the university? First of all, I think of religious traditions as large-scale megasystems for human flourishing. They're the kind of problems and things that universities ought to be tackling, like governments and markets and genomes. But more importantly, because the most visible, the most influential, the most complicated traditions in our world today among them are religions. All religions are traditions. Not every tradition is a religion. Some non-religious traditions are extremely valuable, like the young tradition of secular human rights. But we should study religions because they're the biggest and the oldest dinosaurs out there still walking the face of the earth. As such, they have a lot to teach us about how all human traditions work, how they create individuals, how they change. 
Religious traditions are like grandparents, or at least like mine. They're not always right. They're often alarmingly wrong, especially when you veer into politics. But they're the eldest in the room. I think they merit at least our respect and attention. They birthed many of the family members now disagreeing with them. And the older you get, the more likely you are to seek their counsel. So why study religions in the university? First, because religions are mega traditions. But second, because one of the jobs that universities are supposed to do is to expose your own traditions for you, to expose them to you. Here's where all this begins to matter at USC. What is USC's purpose for undergraduates? I would say to reveal your traditions to you so that you can see them clearly for the first time, perhaps, and gain freedom and gain wisdom. When I was a freshman in college at Stanford, I relished the feeling that I was casting aside all of the assumptions and beliefs I had packed with me from home. I was discovering new books, new ideas, new kinds of people. I had come to California from a narrow corner of Ohio and an even narrower religious tradition. So this was a healthy development, to be sure. But since then, I've come to see things a little differently. I've aged, I've become a husband and a father, and of all things, I've become a college professor who teaches freshmen again. You may have heard that college is supposed to be the time when you learn to think for yourself, to discover what you believe, to begin becoming the person you will be in your adult life. All of that is true. But I think we really fail students when we only say that. No one ever tells you how to do all of that. Fulfilling your major requirements, you all know well, often has very little, possibly nothing, to do with learning to think for yourself, to discover what you believe, to decide whom you will be. When these things happen, they primarily happen in experiences we have come to call the humanities, but truth be told, sometimes only accidentally in some humanities classes, because humanities classes do encourage you to think for yourself, but often without equipping you with the means to do so. We tell you to think for yourself, but we don't tell you that just to start thinking more is not going to get you very far. Here's where I think traditions come in. College is supposedly a time to throw off traditions you were raised with and think as an individual. But in order to truly become an individual, you must best understand the traditions that have shaped you. The traditions you have to learn best are the ones you can see the least, since you are still breathing their air with every thought. And the traditions that are the hardest to examine up close are the ones that are the most powerful. Eternal rewards for good behavior, the American dream, male superiority, white superiority, reunion with loved ones after death, consumer prosperity, the invisible hand of the free market, not to mention a thousand different religious beliefs. When I teach undergraduate classes, I listen to the words students use. Students only rarely use their own words at first. I'm talking about the first semester of freshman year. I usually hear the words of their traditions or their parents or expressions favored in social media that year or words intended to match the image of a collegiate experience. But my goal and our goal at USC should be to help students identify and exercise these other voices, to identify, scrutinize, and clean out that cacophony in one's mind. Only after doing this can you begin to think for yourself. Studying religions in the university is the very best way to do this, if I may say so. We apply state-of-the-art methods to excavate, examine, and evaluate all the strata of the oldest, most sophisticated, most influential traditions alive in the world today, the traditions we call religions. This power also makes religions the most frustrating and the most dangerous traditions in the world. A teacher of mine liked to say, studying religion in the university is playing with fire. So if you're going to do it, be damn sure you're doing it well. The best part of my job is helping students encounter and explore for themselves their own traditions. Now, if a student was raised in conservative Judaism and discovers Zen Buddhism, fantastic. If a student is raised atheist and discovers Hinduism, fantastic. Both true stories, by the way. 
But if a student is raised Hindu and comes to a deeper appreciation of her own religion, both more critical and more sympathetic, that is also excellent. If a student is raised in the evangelical Protestant world and comes to recognize that Christian traditions are much older and diverse and flexible and interesting than what he was led to believe growing up, that is also excellent. So I dare you to take some classes in the School of Religion, revising or revolutionizing your relationship to your own traditions can be the most lasting part of your college experience. Touring all the way around your current ecosystem is the first step to finding out what kind of animal you are. Working critically within your own tradition is a more daring way to reason for yourself than simply rejecting all traditions because you think you don't need them. My freshman year of college was pretty intense, but by my junior year, I'd picked a major I had met my future wife, as it happened, and I was studying abroad at Oxford for two terms. I spent a lot of time walking the little alleys of Oxford that wind from college to college and pub to pub. Perhaps like some of you, I was still searching for a new orientation to the beliefs my family taught me, something that seemed more sustainable as an adult, something, to be honest, less embarrassing. I hadn't yet decided whether to close the door on that particular religion or just keep my hand on the doorknob for a few more years. I recall reading a book around that time that said, religious faith is not a door, but a hinge. But the image that kept returning to me during my walks around Oxford wasn't doorways. It was the image of finding a place to stand. Maybe this is because of the horrible weather in England, it was always raining. But I remember thinking a lot about mud, that was my image. I felt like the more I dwelled on my own religious tradition, the more my feet felt stuck in mud, not really moving forward, yet unable to go back. I wished I could just pull my shoes out of it completely, step onto a dry paved road, and stand there unhindered. I thought about how stable a concrete sidewalk feels underfoot. And then something dawned on me, and I remember the exact moment I was walking south on St. Giles Road on a cold spring day. When your feet begin to slip in the mud, there are two ways to regain your footing. One is to step out of the mud onto the sidewalk. This brings some stability and fixes your feet in place. But the other way is just to sink a little further down until the initial slipperiness stops. That too brings its own kind of stability and gives your feet a definite place to stand. Thank you. So we have 20 minutes for questions. I, I, I've been told to handle that myself. So if there's any questions, I'm ask any question. As a colleague of mine says, ask any question you wish, and I might answer it. Thank you so much for speaking. Uh, I was wondering which choice you went with in terms of the mud situation mm. and how that panned out yeah, for you. Yeah, that's a good question. That's a good question. Um, yeah, I, I eventually decided to stay stuck in the mud. Um, we go to an Episcopal church now. That was not what I was raised with, but, I th but we're, I'm, I'm comfortable there. And uh, that also has to do with some things that I was you know, reading in graduate school and reading older Christian books was a big light bulb for me. Thank you. You're welcome. First of all, that was a great talk. That was just a really beautifully well-crafted talk. Thank you so much. Thanks. I have so many questions for you, but the, yeah. the, the, the one that jumped to my mind is I heard a, a TED talk where a guy got up and he said, the, it was Alain Dubouton, and uh -huh. what he said was uh -huh. the most boring question we can ask about any religion is whether or not it's true. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And so I'm wondering when you decided to stay within your tradition or, or mm. you know, to shift a little bit within Christianity, but, mm. but to, to sink down into it, mm -hmm. did there come a point at which it didn't matter to you whether or not it was true? Mm. The way you talked about tradition, it, yeah. it, it struck me that it might. Yeah. 
This is a live debate in philosophy of religion. Now, I'll get to a personal answer in a moment, but since I'm a professor. Yeah, this is a live debate about whether, and the question is, uh, whether we can just talk about traditions as being incommensurable. They, they even measure whether they're true or not in completely different terms, so it's impossible to even compare. There is no sort of overarching standard of what would be true that we can compare them all to, because that would belong to one of the traditions. So this is a, this is a difficult question. Personally, I go back and forth. I, I prefer to think in the metaphor of capaciousness and flexibility. And I like the tradition I'm in now because it feels very capacious and it feels very flexible. And I had a whole section that I cut, but about uh, the sign of a strong tradition is when it's internally variegated enough that it can contradict itself and still survive. And I think uh, I remember a colleague telling me when I was in school, Buddhism flows like a river. Why can't Christianity flow like a river, right? Christians tend to have things a little bit more segmented, <laughs> true, false. Um, so yeah, I, I guess to be honest, both, that's an open question. And, uh, but I like traditions that are capacious and flexible, and, and I'm content on that count for now. Thank you for that. I'm thinking about, um, how you talked about uh, the undergraduate experience and the discernment of, the, of the, the tradition that's shaping you. One of the things we're dealing with so much is students with kind of multiple um, mm -hmm. religious identities mm -hmm. uh, for, for reasons of mixed households sure. or just mixed commitments. So I'm curious if you would just extend for a moment into that yeah. realm, the thinking you were sharing with us. Yeah, I think there are a variety of ways. I mean, and this is this is based on again what I've sort of seen in the classroom for eight years at least. But there are different ways that, that this sort of um, encounter with tradition can happen in undergraduate studies. And some of it comes if someone says, "I wasn't raised in any tradition, any 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 definite famous old religious tradition, one of the big ones." And um, but I'm I'm interested in encountering something. And I think there is an experience of bumping up against something that's very different from what you were raised with that can sort of have like a jarring effect. You know, when, when we see the particle accelerator diagrams, first it's an impact, and then you see a map, right? I think that sort of that same experience can happen. And that can happen if you're raised, let's say, in Christianity and explore Buddhism, or raised with nothing at all in particular and st explore Hinduism. These are things that I've, I've seen before. I think that would offer more than one path to students that have been raised in multiple traditions. Um, and I, I, I wouldn't want them to feel that they have to uh, end up at some sort of uh, you know, final synthesis because you know, that's uh, something that the traditions themselves have really not been able to do. So we shouldn't ask the undergraduates to, but, that, but that's, uh, that's uh, there are more than one way to encounter those traditions respect. I sort of painted them simplest way, of working inside your own, but in fact, as we all know, you can encounter something different. You can encounter something similar. You can come from apparently nothing to something that's older. Since being here, I've been very, very impressed with our religion department as having a culture that is friendly to the practice of religion more than I've seen elsewhere, mm -hmm. particularly at Stanford. And it's just something that, of course, in our position, that matters to us a lot. Mm -hmm. And it's a beautiful, wonderful thing. And I just wonder if you have any comments about how you, I mean, you exemplify that. I've seen you, you know, in action mm -hmm. exemplifying that. And, uh, have you thought about that problem? And yeah. how, how, you know, what's your, your philosophy about that yeah. personally? I mean, so there is a danger um, that I don't feel frequently, but I understand when some people feel if, the people studying religion are too close to it or too sympathetic or view themselves as sort of, I'm not saying this is myself, but view themselves as um, sort of curators of their own tradition and that's their mode of scholarship. There's a danger that other scholars get anxious about that you don't have enough critical distance. Right. And if something arises that needs critique, um, and there are situations uh, where I went to graduate school, there was a woman uh, worked on Hinduism. She's a very uh, esteemed international scholar. I think critically sympathetic to the tradition, and yet her book was banned in certain countries because it just took a step too far. But you have to have that ability to study the religion as it needs to be studied. So there's that concern. 
On the other hand, uh, you know, these are people's homes that we are going inside with our anthropological notebooks, right? And there is a sort of hospitality and uh, um, a kind of code of conduct, I think, that's appropriate. And, and for me, at least, part of that involves uh, as much hospitality as you can communicate, you know, especially to undergraduate students um, who might be, as I was when I arrived as a freshman, very anxious about uh, going to talk with the scholars of religion, right, who seemed kind of maybe out to get you or something like that. That was not the case here. At USC, we're very fortunate. Yeah, as you're right, we have uh, a lot of uh, teaching awards. We have a lot of mentorship awards just as, as benchmarks of that. Um, and I, I hope it's not just luck of the draw that we have a really great assortment of people. It might just be that. But we have, uh, whatever it is, since you were at USC, um, not just myself, but we have some really great teaching faculty who have share that, that same sort of ethos. Um, my question was um, back to whether it's true or yeah. not. Yeah. Isn't it true if it's true to you? Uh, I suppose that's one way to state. Yeah, I mean, I think what, what I'm trying to, you know, obviously what everyone's trying to wrestle with is the experience we've all had where you meet someone of a different faith equally convinced of its truth. Um, yeah, I guess I would, I would think that s some of these things uh, have to do with how long have you lived with it in your own particular life and what sort of um, spaces has that opened for your life um, and what sort of uh, platform for you to stand have you found. And it is ultimately, yes, it is ultimately experiential. So, um, yeah, I guess I would agree with that to, to a degree. Religions are very complicated things. In some centuries, there was much more intersection with the sciences, claims about the nature of the universe. Uh, even today, people disagree about uh, claims about the nature of human communities, claims about the nature of ethical principles, or law, or human composition. What are we made of? And when we start to see how religions speak to those more defined areas of knowledge, there can be real disagreements. And then there's disagreements about, well, I have some data, and you have some data, right? And then, so what's motivating our data? Our data are conflicting, so we, that's a problem we have to resolve. So it can get more complicated than that particular motto. Um, but I think at least on the scale, if we talk about scale, on the scale of a life that resonates with me, maybe I'm just staying at home, then I put on my academic hat, and then we have more conflict. But that's a tough one, it's a tough one. Um, in class today, we were speaking about the gaze, um, the gaze of the beloved, feeling seen or witnessed, and a lot of older people feel invisible. And I know you appreciate Nicholas of Cusa, but could you tell us other people, um, if not from medieval period, that have helped you understand the loving gaze mm. or being seen? This is not an act, this is not a, I mean, in a good way. Um, I had a friend who was in graduate school with me, and uh, like many people, he left the University of Chicago, and he left after a little while, and it wasn't, you know, like he couldn't hack it, he was, you know, we were study partners and so forth. But he just decided that for him, he had a different path, and his path was to join the L'Arche community in Nova Scotia. And this is a community where the primary members of the community are disabled and handicapped adults, mentally, often severe mental handicaps. And uh, then there are supporting members of the community, like he was, uh, who help everyone live their daily life. And, and that's, that's pretty much it. And they pray together. And they live together. They eat together. They wash themselves together. And they just sort of live together. And I, that's, you know, Henry Nouwen worked there for many years. It's founded the sister community, or the original community by Jean Vanier. Um, I, if, if that interests, if that sort of thing interests anyone, I would encourage you to go look it up online. But uh, that sort of community was a, a quite an example of what it means to take individuals from uh, usually marginalized places in societies put them at the center of the community, 
and then have the privilege of living alongside them and supporting their community life. I mean, it's a really radical model. He was there for four or five years. Yes. Um, so I saw in the, the description uh, that maybe like uh, Christian mysticism was going to be mm. discussed. So I was mm -hmm. wondering um, maybe if that played into anything you had said in the talk. Sure, sure. Yeah, that's my that's technically my you know specialty. That's what I work on. So Christian mysticism is sort of a part of, of Christian traditions in the West and in the Christian East, but it's um, kind of a subversive tradition. It's usually authors that the institution finds to be uh, a little too much off on their own. Maybe the institution says, don't you need us? And the people say, no, we're good, right? So those people are sort of mystics who are working without the mediation of the institution in their encounter with the divine, at least in Christian traditions. It's a strange term because it was invented by scholars in the, you know, in the, 18, in the 18th century um, and has some connections. You can go back and look at it and kind of reconstruct your tradition. So to some extent, it's an artificial Christian tradition, and it really should be woven into the fabric of, of, of uh, lived spirituality, both back then and today. Um, but I think that that was something that I found um, interesting because it's sort of been on the margins for centuries. And so that's what I've invested in in terms of my own scholarship. Teach a class on that if anyone's interested on love and desire in medieval mysticism. That sounds good. Good. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>